Okay, we are moving right along. So we are moving up our body system and going up to the knee. Um, this PowerPoint is way fancier than all my other PowerPoints because when I interviewed for this job quite a long time ago, I had to give this lecture as a part of my job interview. So I spent a lot of time on this PowerPoint to make sure it was perfect. So there's a lot of extra stuff in this PowerPoint that aren't normally in my other ones because I don't have quite as much time anymore. So the knee. So the knee is going to be super important, especially if you are wanting to go into physical therapy or athletic training. Because the knee is going to be one of the most complex joints we're going to be looking at. It's also one of the most commonly injured joints. So these percentages and stats were for quite a few years now ago, so they probably have actually increased. So that first stat, the 39 to 46%, is cases that were seen in the doctor's office for just one year. So out of all the patients, 39 to 46% of the patients with a joint issue were coming in for their knee. Um, and we also have almost like 150,000 ACL injuries per year. And knee injuries exclusively cost the U.S. healthcare system $500 million per year. So the knee is super commonly injured and it costs a lot of money to fix knee injuries. Okay, and you're not going to be tested on those stat numbers, so you don't need to memorize them. Okay, so some general information on it. So we're going to talk about what type of joint it is. So if we go back to our joint kind of knowledge, it is going to be a modified hinge joint. So if you remember a hinge joint, think of a door hinge. It opens and closes, and that's what the knee is going to do. So it's going to have just flexion and extension. So it kind of opens, closes like a, a door hinge. But it's called that modified hinge joint because it has a tiny bit of internal and external rotation. So you can see it has movements, flexion, extension, and then it has just a touch of internal and external rotation, which is called the screw home mechanism. So the screw home mechanism, there's lots of animations on this thing, is basically when you are trying to reach full extension your tibia is going to have to rotate in order to kind of lock in. So in order to meet that final, that final amount of extension, your tibia has to rotate so you can lock in to full extension. And then when you have to try to come out and you go to flex, it has to kind of unlock and rotate the other way. So you can see in this picture, if we're extending, you can see that tibia and that fibula kind of externally rotate, getting you into max extension. And then when you want to try to unlock, it has to internally rotate so you can kind of open up and get in place. So that is that screw home mechanism. And then we're going to talk about the anatomy, both the bony and the soft tissue. So looking at bony anatomy, specifically what joints are going to be involved. So we're going to have our femur, our tibia, and our fibula. So we already know our tibia and our fibula. And then we're also going to add in our patella. So our femur will be our thigh bone. So we have, this is our knee. We have our femur, our thigh bone, our tibia, our fibula, and then our patella is our kneecap. So all of those are what's going to make up that knee joint. And within your knee joint, kind of exclusively, you have smaller joints. So remember what I said about joints? They're easy. You can just take the first part of each name. So tibio, femoral, tibia to femur. So our main kind of joint of the knee is our tibio femoral joint. That will be the distal, uh, or proximal, sorry, proximal end of our tibia to our distal end of our femur, and that is our knee. So basically where we're gonna have our flexion and extension. We're also gonna have patellofemoral. So patella to femur, 
as we can see on here, your patella sits right on that femur in the groove and it will move back and forth in that groove on your femur. So we got patella femoral, so under tibia, same thing, tibia femoral. We're also gonna have our superior tibiofibular joint. So we know that the tibia and the fibula connect at the bottom, right? But we also know they're gonna connect at the top. So this would be considered part of that kind of knee joint, but it's just gonna be the connection between our fibula to our tibia. You can see it right here, tibia to fibula. And then we still just have patellofemoral. So really when you think of the knee, you're gonna think tibia femoral and patellofemoral. What bone do you notice does not touch the femur? So we know tibia touches the femur. Does our fibula touch the femur? No. So that is another reason why our fibula is pretty useless and it only bears 13% of our body weight. So we don't have any of our forces transmitting along that fibula. So it's really just sitting off to the side. So that's why you can break your fibula and have no real problems and you can be weight bearing and not even notice it. Okay, so going on to some of the bony landmarks on our femur. So we will start with our medial condyle, which I think I have a little things, yeah. Medial condyle. So it's gonna be at the distal end of our femur, so down at the bottom. And we know our medial and lateral condyle already because what muscle did we learn in the ankle connects to them? What's the only muscle in the ankle you learned that crossed the knee? Bad if you don't know, you're not gonna do very well on the test. Gastroc, remember? Gastrocnemius connects to medial and lateral femoral condyle. So our medial condyle is going to be this one. So you can see this whole ball, medial condyle. You know it is medial because whatever direction the head is pointed in is medial. So if I look at this, I know that this way is going to be medial because this is what attaches your leg to the rest of your body. So I always know this side will be medial. So medial condyle will be the whole ball right there. And on top of the medial condyle, you will have your adductor tubercle. So on this medial condyle, it's harder to see, you have a secondary little bump right above it. So that's that adductor tubercle, and that's where all of our adductor muscles will attach. So the reason why your bones have different bumps is because they have muscles attaching onto them, and then when we use the muscles, the muscles pull on the bone, creating shape. So anywhere where it's super smooth, it means that there's no muscles attaching on there and pulling on there because there's nothing to create new kind of shapes. So that's why they say like resistance training is really good because it actually causes your bones to grow and thicken. So that's why old people, when they don't do anything, they get really thin bones. So that adductor tubercle is the bump right on top. So then the lateral condyle will be on the opposite side. So again, we know this is medial. So this side will be lateral. So lateral condyle is this whole bump right here. So lateral condyle, see right there. And, ooh, this one doesn't have it. So we're gonna have our lateral epicondyle, which I don't have a little blip for. So just like with our adductor tubercle, we're gonna have a secondary bump right on top that is that lateral epicondyle. So Epi, you can kind of think of like being on top of, epi kind of goes to top. So the lateral epicondyle is the bump right on top of it. Okay. So next, our patellar groove or our patellar surface. 
So this is where, that's loud. So it is where our patella is going to sit. So it's hard to see in this one because we have a patella attached. But right in between, on the anterior side, between the medial femoral condyle and the lateral femoral condyle, we're going to have like a dip or a groove. It's kind of shallowed out. And that's where our patella is going to sit. So as we contract and um, our quadriceps, it's going to pull our patella through that patellar groove. And lastly, our intracondylar notch, or also called our intracondylar fossa. So inter means in between, right? Condylar, condyle. And fossa means a shallow kind of bowl or groove. So in between our medial and lateral femoral condyle, you can see we have this space, this gap running in between. That's going to be our intercondylar fossa. So in between both condyles and it's a deep groove. And in that groove is where all of our kind of nerves, arteries, and veins are going to sit nicely protected in that groove. So like our sciatic nerve, our, the artery that supplies your whole lower leg will be going in there. Any questions on femur? So your femur is super thick, super strong. So your femur is one of the strongest bones in your body. In order to break your femur, it's basically like pounding through concrete. So whenever you hear that someone has broken their femur, you know it was a really significant injury because of how strong it is. Um, that's why you'll see a lot of older people will break their femurs a lot more easily because they lose all their bone mass. So then theirs is very thin and brittle and they're able to snap it off easier. But especially maybe um, a fracture up here is a little more common. But if you were to get a fracture like in the mid shaft, so of the straight part, that would be a very significant injury. Okay, moving on to tibia. So we kind of already know tibia, but this is some of the stuff we didn't learn last time. So we're looking at the top part of it. So first, the tibial plateaus. So has anyone heard the word plateau before? So if you were saying like your weight loss plateaued, what would that mean? No one's heard that word before? Yeah, it becomes straight, right? So it's like if you plateau, it means you were doing well, and then you kind of plateaued out, went straight. So if you notice the top of the tibia, you come up, and then it goes flat at the top. So this top flat aspect are the tibial plateaus. So we have one tibial plateau, so flat right here, and then another tibial plateau, flat right there. So that's the kind of most uh, proximal portion of our tibia, the flat part on the top, the plateaus. So next we will have our intercondylar eminence. So what did intercondylar mean? So between the condyles and an eminence is basically something that is like sticking out. Um, if you've, Maybe you've heard the word like emanating, that you're exuding it. So if you look at the top, and if I go back, you can see it a little bit more. So at the t very top of the tibial plateau, you can see you have these two little bump prongs that stick out. So if you can see up here, you've got one and two. They stick up from the tibial plateaus, and they would, if I put my femur on, they would go up where that like metal thing is. They would go up in between the medial and lateral femoral condyle. So they are protruding up into that space and that's where we're gonna have our ligaments are going to attach onto here. So that is our intercondylar eminence right there. Next, our tibial tuberosity. 
This is a very important bony landmark because this is where all of our quads are going to attach onto. So your tibial tuberosity is on the anterior side and you'll see you have kind of those uh, condyles, their plateaus, and then just, just down we have this bump kind of straight in the center. So you can feel this on yourself. So if you take your own knee, kind of put your, bend your knee out, put your hand at the bottom of your patella, and just slide down, you'll feel a bump. Some of you might have a larger bump than others, depending on how tall you are, um, your muscular definition, if you played sports. Um, if you play sports with a lot of jumping, you probably ha will have a larger tibial tuberosity than others because all those muscles pull and yank on that tibial tuberosity and it will grow, which actually is a illness or kind of a disease. Um, has anyone heard of Osgood Slaughter's disease? So usually the taller girls are the ones who, because I had Osgood slaughters, usually means we grew a little too fast. And so our quads yanked and pulled on our bones. So we always had knee pain, probably in like middle school, high school. So tibial tuberosity. And next we will have Gertie's tubercle. Gertie's tubercle is not super prominent. Ooh, got hair in my eye. It's more of just if you could, if I could let you guys touch the bone, you'd be able to feel it a little bit better. But basically, the Gertie's tubercle is going to be sitting on that lateral condyle of the tibia. Um, if you feel it, you all of a sudden will have kind of a smaller bump right in front of it. And really, that's just where some muscles and ligaments are going to attach, which is why we point it out, but a lot of people don't even point it out because it's almost kind of an imaginary spot. So Gertie's tubercle is on the lateral condyle of the tibia. Easiest of them all, fibula only has the fibular head, which is the top. Easiest part. Okay, any questions on bony anatomy? Okay, um, I will post some coloring pages of the bones so you can practice your labeling and stuff like that. Okay, and I guess we have one more bone. I forgot about patella because it's kind of a random bone. So our patella is a sesamoid bone. So it is kind of in isolation on its own. So the patella has an apex and a base. In my opinion, these are switched, and I always mess them up in my head. The apex is the point, and it is the bottom. So the inferior edge is the apex, which in my head is opposite. I think of apex as being like the peak, the top, but it's not. So the point is the apex, and that's the inferior surface. And the base is actually the top, which again seems contradictory in my opinion. So the apex is a point, and the base is going to be a larger surface area, which is why it's called the base. Then we are going to have our articular surface. Articular, articulate, those words, are basically meaning where two bones touch. So if we're going to say the articular surface, that is the posterior, the back of the patella, where it articulates with the femur. So where it touches, where it sits on the femur. So that posterior aspect of it is what's going to be on the femur. And you can get some problems with that articular surface. So if you take your hand on your knee, and you straighten your knee back and forth, you probably feel some crunchies, right? So that is usually a problem with your articular surface. You get like fuzzies on the back and those are what cause that pop. Okay, soft tissue. So we have muscles, tendons, we have ligaments, we have menisci, or our meniscus, we have our bursa, 
and we have our neurovascular. But today, we're not doing muscular. We'll do that next time. We're going to go straight to ligaments. Okay. So ligaments you've probably heard of. So we will have, well there is more, but four main ligaments in our ankle. Or not ankle, me. I'm sure you've heard of them. ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. Now, there are two types of ligaments in the knee. Cruciate ligaments and collateral ligaments. Cruciate means cross. So these ligaments would cross each other. So of the cruciate ligaments, we're going to have the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL, and the posterior cruciate ligament, the PCL. So anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments, our ACL and our PCL, are going to cross each other, hence their name. So we can see in this picture right here, the anterior cruciate ligament is crossing, it's going from anterior tibia, crossing to posterior uh, femur. And then our posterior cruciate ligament will be starting at the posterior tibia and going up to the anterior femur. So they cross, they overlap each other. Versus our collateral ligaments. So our collateral, basically, think of like parallel. So they're running collateral to each other in a straight line. So we'll have our medial collateral ligament, our MCL, and our lateral collateral ligament, our LCL, which these are pretty easy to identify because we know the fibula will always be lateral. So then we know this ligament is the lateral collateral ligament, LCL, and then this ligament will be medial collateral ligament, MCL, because it's on the medial side. So if we look specifically at the ACL, so anterior cruciate ligament, so you do need to know what the letters stand for. You can't just know ACL. So this is the path of the ACL. So it is running from, so these words seem really fancy, anteromedial, intercondylar eminence of the tibia. So if we know we have the two bumps. Those are those intercondylar eminences. The first one, the ACL, is going to run from the anteromedial intercondylar eminence. So it's running from this inner bump. So out of the two prongs, that inside bump. It's going to then go backwards and insert into the medial wall of the lateral femoral condyle which fancy words mean the inside aspect of that lateral femoral condyle. So it's running from medial anterior tibia to posterior lateral femoral condyle. Another reason why they're called cruciates is because they are made up of different bundles. So they have an anteromedial and a posterior lateral bundle Basically, two kind of aspects intertwined together, crossing over. So the ACL is going to resist anterior displacement of the tibia. So what that means would be the tibia coming forward. So it's going to resist this from coming forward, just coming out anteriorly. So if I put this together again. So it's going to resist this motion coming forward. It also is going to resist tibial internal and external rotation. So that would be rotating this part kind of in and out. 
and it's going to stabilize against hyperextension. So that would be, it's hard because this is kind of locked out, going this direction, overextending that um, knee. Versus our PCL will be coming from the posterior aspect of the tibia, so just the back of the tibia, to the lateral portion or the lateral wall of the medial femoral condyle. So again, it's just coming in to the inner portion of that medial femoral condyle. You have the same sort of bundles. You have anterolateral, posterior, medial bundles, so just crossing aspects. And the resistance of this is going to be kind of the opposite. So it's going to resist posterior displacement of the tibia, which would be the tibia moving backwards. So coming this direction instead of forwards. So posterior displacement of the tibia, which is kind of hyperextension, right? And it's going to resist tibial external rotation, which would be rotating out. So coming this way and this way is what it is resisting. You can see this is a posterior view. So you can see the posterior cruciate ligament is pretty thick, kind of sitting on the back. Okay, now to our MCL. That MCL is going to originate on the adductor tubercle. So we know our medial condyle with the bump just above it, that adductor tubercle. It's going to originate off of the adductor tubercle. It's going to come down, attach to your medial meniscus. So running in between. And then it's going to insert onto the superior medial tibia. So about right here. So superior medial tibia. It is going to resist knee valgus, which does anyone remember valgus? Did that mean joints coming together or coming apart? Remember like the gum sticks together thing, right? So knee valgus would be your knee coming in, so knee valgus. So it's going to resist that motion, so getting like hit from the outside coming in. And it's going to resist rotation to a degree. Versus the LCL, which you can already tell is much thinner than that MCL. Your LCL is almost like a pencil, it's so thin. So it's going to run from lateral epicondyle, which we know is the bump on the top of that lateral condyle, and it's going to attach straight onto the fibular head. It does not attach to the lateral meniscus, so that's why oftentimes if you have an MCL tear, You've oftentimes also torn your medial meniscus because they're attached. Versus if you tear your LCL, you don't often tear your lateral meniscus because they're not attached. So it's going to resist knee varus, which would be coming out. So getting hit this way and it kind of going out. And rotation to a degree. So just a little bit of rotation. And you can see, um, sometimes they'll also refer to it as fibula collateral ligament, but we say lateral collateral ligament. Okay. So next, you're going to have your meniscus or your menisci when you're referring to them both. We will have a medial and a lateral meniscus. And our meniscus are going to sit right on top of our tibial plateaus. So those flat, smooth surface, our menisci are going to sit right on there. Our medial will of course be medial, and we know it will be because we know our fibula sits on the lateral side. But we can also tell because it is more of a C shape. 
So look at the light blue. The darker blue, that is the articular surface, the cartilage. So I want you to look at this lighter blue, almost white color. So the medial meniscus is more of a C versus the lateral meniscus is an O. So it's more fully attached. See that? So you have C shape versus lateral meniscus is O shaped. But you can also just tell because you can see the fibula sitting right there. So then you know that's going to be lateral and that's going to be medial. So what's the purpose of your menisci? So they sit in between your femur and your tibia. They provide lubrication to the joint, so allowing for smooth motion. They allow for shock absorption. So if you think about your body, all of your body forces and your weight is kind of going through your knees. So anytime you would land from like a jump or something, if you didn't have your meniscus, your bone would just be hitting straight bone, which would be very uncomfortable and very painful. So your meniscus sit in between to absorb that shock. They're kind of just like jelly cushions. They reduce the friction. So they allow for kind of smooth, because again, if our bones were just rubbing against each other, that would be too good. And they provide joint congruency. So what joint congruency means is basically if a joint is completely congruent, it means it fits perfectly. So if we look here, we still have some space in between. So it actually would probably be like this. We have some space running in between those bones. So we want to fill them up to make them congruent. So those meniscus kind of sit in between and fill up all the space and make it so when our, we're going straight, they fit perfectly together and there's no empty spaces. So joint congruency. A very important part of your menisci is the zones of vascularity. So if you've known anybody with a meniscus tear, maybe some of them got surgery for it, some of them didn't, some of them got what's called a meniscectomy, which means they just got that part chopped out, or they had a repair done, it got sutured back together. It, that and what's going to happen to you if you have a meniscus tear is all due to the zones of vascularity. So vascularity means your blood supply. So you have an avascular, inner two-thirds. Avascular means no blood supply. And you have a partially vascular outer third. So in order for a injury to heal, you need blood. Can you pull your mask up? Thank you. So you need blood. Blood brings all the nutrients to the area, brings everything it needs to heal itself. So if you have a meniscus tear in the avascular inner two-thirds, that will not heal on its own. It will need to be surgically probably removed. So generally, if you have kind of a tear on this um, inner aspect, they just go in with little clompers. They look like little crocodile teeth, and they literally just chop it away and make it all smooth again. They just make your meniscus smaller. If it is a, in the vascular region, where it does have blood supply, it may heal on its own if it's small enough. So a lot of times they'll just let it go, you let it heal. Or they will do a repair. Well, they will suture it back together to allow the body to help heal it. So that's why sometimes people with meniscus tears get surgery, and why sometimes they don't. And a meniscectomy is a lot quicker of a healing process than a repair because you're just getting it chopped out. You're not having something done trying to make it heal. <clears throat> okay, our bursa, you don't need to know all of these. You won't be tested on all of them. But basically, you should know bursa are going to be fluid-filled sacs that are located at all points of friction. So they start out basically deflated, and they go in areas of friction, so between bone and muscle, between bone and skin. So this one is probably the one that people notice the most if anyone has hit their knee really hard. Um, this might uh, pop up pretty bad or explode. 
So they tend to be in areas where you're going to have a lot of rubbing action. And when they get irritated, they will fill with fluid and puff up real big to protect the area. So neurovascular, neuro referring to nerves, vascular referring to blood supply. So this is the only time I'm really going to talk to you about nerves and arteries. We will have our sciatic nerve, which you've probably heard of sciatica. It's one of our biggest, it's very thick, most important nerves that runs down the back of our leg. And it's at this point that it splits. So it splits into a tibial nerve, which runs down in that intercondylar notch. And then it also splits to a common peroneal nerve, which will wrap around the lateral side. And the only reason I'm bringing these up is because they can get injured. And that will supply the front of your leg versus this tibial will supply the back. And now the most important part is that popliteal artery. Popliteal refers to the back of the knee. So the popliteus is always the back of the knee. So this is your main artery that runs down in this intercondylar notch. And it's going to be super important when I talk about an injury in a second. So running down the back of your knee. So some of the injuries that can occur, sprains, which is an injury to a ligament, a strain, which is an injury to a muscle, dislocations, meniscus tears, bursitis, and tendonitis. So a sprain is going to be a stretching or tearing of a ligament. So <clears throat> you can have varying degrees of a sprain. You can sprain your ankle or sprain your ACL but not require surgery. Because you have just stretched it a little bit, it's not torn, and it can heal and scar back down. Or you can have kind of a partial tear should be a more significant sprain that may require surgery, but it's not fully torn. And then a complete tear would be a rupture where there's no longer any connection. But those are all still sprains. They're all injuries to a ligament. So generally, um, if you have probably greater than a partial tear of your ACL, you're probably going to have surgery. So you can see a complete rupture would entitle surgery for sure. If you rupture your posterior cruciate ligament, your PCL, you do not need surgery because your PCL is kind of worthless. So if you tear them, they don't even repair it. They just cut it out, so then it doesn't cause any problems. Your MCL, again, if it ruptured, that would require some surgery. Uh, but you don't see that as often because it does have a good blood supply. So with our sprains, these are probably what you are going to hear the most about. Our ACL, I think I have a picture, yeah. So you often are going to tear your ACL or give a sprain on your own. So generally ACL injuries don't require any contact. So you've probably seen, and I know I have seen many, of the person is just running along and then they just go down and start screaming. So that is happening when they are decelerating. So they are running, they're going to decelerate to slow down, they don't have full control, and their tibia is going to translate anteriorly out of their control and rupture that ACL. Or with twisting, you'll see a lot of times people will plant and twist and tear their ACL. Or hyperextension. So if you have a super heavy hyperextension, it can tear that. So we can see these are two examples of some common ACL mechanisms. So this is a mechanism of injury. Um, so this is like RG3 who has like torn his ACL like 15,000 times. So he is obviously planting and twisting, rupturing his ACL, versus this guy is doing a hyperextension mechanism. So we can see his knee is traveling way too far that direction. 
Let me see which one I have next. Yes, PCL. So PCL, mechanism of injury, is hyperextension or full flexion. So you can do this by overly hyperextending, or I saw it in a volleyball player who went to get a ball, and when she dove, she just dropped straight down onto her knee, like literally jumped, dropped, landed straight on her knee, pushed her tibia posteriorly, and ruptured it that way. So she just dropped and landed. So here would be a good example of a full flexion. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but this is the front of him. So his knee is bending the opposite direction of how it should be. So this is the back of his knee. <clears throat> this would be a life-threatening <laughs> injury and he would need to go to the ER. Because, I'll tell you in a second, he may have just injured his popliteal artery. So MCL is a valgus force, meaning you would get hit from the outside and your knee would go uncontrolled in. Also in rotation and cutting, you will often tear your ACL and your MCL together. So we can see in these pictures, this is a good valgus force when he is cutting on his own. So he is kind of going this direction. This often happens when if you're in a sport that involves like tackling, you may be running, someone may tackle you from the outside. Or in this case, I think this is Steph Curry, um, his shoe got caught on the floor and he couldn't control it. So he went too far in and tore his MCL. Versus LCL, you don't see this very often. Um, I've never had anyone tear their LCL in isolation. I once had a football player who tore all of these, <clears throat> but I've never seen people with just LCL. So that's a varus force. So getting hit from the inside, going out, which generally doesn't happen because I don't know, I mean, maybe football players or anything. When you're running, usually people don't tackle you from in. Um, oftentimes wrestlers will tear their LCLs just because of the kind of awkward positions they get put in or if their leg gets caught, they're more likely to tear it than anybody else. Um, and it can happen with rotation and cutting. It's so weird and uncommon oops, that I don't even have a good picture of it happening because no one really does it. Um, so you can see if this was like a person tackling that would cause that injury. A strain is going to be a stretch or a tear of a muscle or a tendon. So if you ever hear someone say they pulled a muscle, that is a strain. So a pulled muscle is a strain. A torn muscle, a tear in a muscle is a strain. They're all strains, but people like to use different words for them because they don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> So stretching or tearing of a muscle, you can have a bit of a stretch, so that'd be a grade one, but it can go back. Grade two, you can see it would be kind of a partial tear. Grade three would be a complete tear. This is often an overuse injury. You maybe did too much too often, <clears throat> or you overloaded it. Um, like you tried to sprint faster than you think you could, you put too much weight on, um, and your muscle couldn't handle it, so it pulled and tore. So dislocations. So this is kind of the most severe of the knee injuries. So a dislocation is going to be an abnormal separation in a joint. So we are okay with joints separating, because that's what they do to move, but this would be an abnormal separation. So you've probably heard a lot of people say, oh, I dislocated my knee. They didn't actually dislocate their knee. They dislocated their kneecap. So a patellofemoral dislocation would be a dislocation of your kneecap. That's not a big deal. It is very, very common. It can happen when you have a direct blow to it. You get hit and it gets forced out. 
Um, you can have what's called like lagging patella. Basically, your muscles are a little imbalanced. They pull one direction too far, so it kind of pulls it out. You can also have a naturally shallow groove. So that groove that the patella sits in, if yours is really shallow, it's easy for it to pop in and out if your musculature is really over imbalanced. So you'll often see people have a very overdeveloped um, lateral quad muscle and a very underdeveloped medial muscle. So you'll tend to dislocate laterally. This is no big deal at all, but people will be like, oh, I dislocated my knee. And it did not. It's just their kneecap. It's super easy, super easy to put back in. Simple. A true knee dislocation would be tibiofemoral. That is what this is. So you can see the femur and the tibia are no longer touching, really. So this, basically this happened, other than his kneecap is up there. This is an emergency. So this is a true knee dislocation versus the other is a kneecap. Anyone know why this would be an emergency if my leg's like this now? Yes, that popliteal artery runs in this in-between part. So if I just go like this, I can potentially rupture my artery. So I'm now bleeding internally and I probably also severed my nerves. So I can sever my nerves to my foot. That would give me a drop foot so I'd have no control over my foot anymore. And if you rupture that artery, obviously you're going to bleed out. So that's what, it's a pet peeve once you learn about it. You're like, you didn't dislocate your knee, you dislocated your kneecap. Because this is an emergency. If you ever think that this happened to your athlete um, or your patient, you have to activate EMS immediately because they could potentially bleed out and die. So this is a huge, huge, huge deal versus the other one, really simple. All you have to do is flex your quad and it'll pop straight back in. Versus this one will require probably a lot of surgery. You've 100% torn all of the ligaments in your knee. You've probably torn your meniscus and you've probably done multiple fractures as well. So much bigger deal. Um, does anyone remember that gymnastics video that was floating around a long time ago? where she landed from, I can show it to you guys next time, and she dislocates both of her knees. Okay, so this is just a simple, this is just the patella. It just pops out, and it's really easy. They can track their quad. You can just go, boop, and they'll go straight back in. Okay, that is all we have time for. Oh, there's another good picture. There's a kneecap dislocation. It looks really grotesque, but it's not that bad. So you should be sitting there. Okay, so that's all we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> we will do the rest and all of the musculature next time.